All right, well, March 27th, 1999, Jericho. The walls did come tumbling down, Gary Byers writes. In the spring of 1997, two Italian archaeologists conducted a limited excavation on the ancient tell of Jericho, Lorenzo Negro, and Niccolo Marchetti, working under the auspices of the new Palestinian Department of Archaeology, evacuated, excavated, rather, evacuated, excavated for one month on the fringes of Kathleen Kenyon's west and south trenches. Their dig was the first foreign expedition in the Palestinian-controlled areas of the West Bank since self-rule began 1994. Here's a picture of it. Take a look at it. The previous uh, YouTube I showed uh, a larger, enlarged piece. I hope I can make this bigger or not. Image properties. Dimensions. Custom size. For 270, I'll make it uh, 540. Double it. And 792. <coughs> well, 1600. Oops. There it is. <coughs> Full size. Full size. Got a little hazy. I think I doubled the size. And anyway, ABR's Bryant Wood, standing beside a section of the collapsed wall of Jericho. That's a smaller picture. After the air excavation, Nigro or Negro and Marchetti announced they found no evidence for a destruction from the time of Joshua. While it is too soon for the academic community to see details of their discoveries, their announcement suggests their excavation was conducted to disprove the biblical account of Joshua's capture of the city. It is further possible that the Palestinian Authority supported this dig for the express purpose of denouncing any Jewish connections to the site. As to their evidence, Dr. Bryant Wood director of the Associates for Biblical Research and one of the leading experts on the archaeology of Jericho, recently responded, it matters little what the Italian archaeologists did not find in the month long dig. The evidence is already in. Three major expeditions to the site over the past 90 years uncovered abundant evidence to support the biblical account. That's what he said. As Wood went on to point out, John Garstang, Kathleen Kenyon, both dug at Jericho for six reasons and a German excavation directed by Ernest, Ernst Sellen and Carl Watzinger, due for three, dug for three. All found abundant evidence for the city's destruction by fire in a layer related to the biblical date of 1400 B.C. September 1997, Dr. Wood visited Jericho and examined the results of the Italian excavation firsthand. Credibly, he found the Italians had uncovered the stone outer revetment wall at the base of the tell with part of the mud brick wall built on top of it still intact. In the bulk of the Italian excavation at the outer base of the revetment wall, Wood noticed the remains of the collapsed mud brick city walls which had tumbled. Not only did the Italians find the same evidence uncovered in the earlier excavations, it fits the biblical story perfectly. The Italian excavation actually uncovered most of the critical evidence related, relating to the biblical story, said Wood. But even more exciting is the fact that all the evidence from the earlier digs has disappeared over time. We, have only, we only have records, drawing, and photos. 
But the Italians then covered a completely new section of the wall, which we did not know still existed. I had my photograph taken, standing next to the wall where the mud brick collapse had just been excavated. Unfortunately, the Italian archaeologists, the Palestinian authorities, the Associated Press, and most of the world didn't, doesn't realize any of this. It is a sad commentary on the state of archaeology in the Holy Land. When the purpose of an excavation at a biblical site is to disprove the Bible and disassociate the site without any historical Jewish connection. But that's why the Associates for Biblical Research is in business. Please pray for our efforts. Just the word for is there. Pray for the removal of all obstacles blocking the publication of Dr. Wood's technical study, The Pottery of Jericho. Please pray for the continued field work, ABR sponsors in Israel. Please pray for our daily efforts in presenting this truth to the world. Saul, David, and Solomon. Saul became the first king of Israel, and his fortress at Kibia has been excavated. One of the most noteworthy finds was that slingshots were one of the primary weapons of the day. This relates not only to David's victory over Goliath, but to the reference of Judges 20 and 16, that there were 700 expert slingers who could sling a stone at a hare and not miss. Upon Saul's death, Samuel tells us that his armor was put in the temple at Ashtaroth, a Canaanite fertility goddess, at Bet Shean, while Chronicle, Chronicles records that his head was put in the temple of Dagon, the Philistine corn god. This was thought to be an error because it seemed unlikely that enemy peoples would have temples in the same place at the same time. However, excavations have revealed that there are two temples at this site that are separated by a hallway, one for Dagon and the other for Ashtaroth. It appears that the Philistines had adopted the Canaanite goddess. One of the key accomplishments of David's reign was the capture of Jerusalem. Problematic in the script, scripture account was that the Israelites entered the city by way of a tunnel that led to the pool of Siloam. Siloam. However, that pool was thought to be outside the city walls at that time, but excavations in the 1960s revealed that the wall did indeed extend well past the pool. The time of Solomon has no less corroboration. The site of Solomon's temple cannot be excavated because it is near the Muslim holy place the Dome of the Rock. However, what is known about the Philistine temples built in Solomon's time fits well with the design, decoration, and materials described in the Bible. The only piece of evidence from the temple itself is a small ornament of pomegranate that sat on the end of a rod and bears the inscription belonging to the Temple of Yahweh. It was first seen in a, in a shop in, in Jerusalem in 1979, was verified in 1984, and was acquired by Israel the Israel Museum in 1988. The excavation of Bezer in 1969 ran across a massive layer of ash that covered most of the mound. Sifting through the ash yielded pieces of Hebrew, Egyptian, and Philistine artifacts. Apparently, all three cultures had been there at the same time. This puzzled researchers greatly until they realized that the Bible confirms exactly what they found. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, had attacked and captured Gezer. He had set it on fire. He killed its Canaanite inhabitants and gave it as a wedding gift to his daughter, Solomon's wife. 1989 article by Alan Miller in Biblical Archaeology Review entered, entitled, Does the Bible Exaggerate King Solomon's Wealth? states, By setting the biblical text outside other than ancient texts and archaeological discoveries, we have shown that the biblical narrative is wholly in keeping with the practices of the ancient world. so far as we can ascertain them, not only in the use of gold, but also in its records of quantities. A lot of bizarre things, and all of a sudden archaeology corroborates them. Okay, how about David? S.H. Horn, an archaeologist, gives an, an excellent example. Do a little fixing there. I didn't realize there's so many typos. They call me Mr. Typo of how archaeological evidence helps in the biblical study. 
he says, archaeological explorations have shed some, shed some interesting light on the capture of Jerusalem by David. The biblical accounts of that capture read, for all read, Now David said on that day, Whoever climbs up by way of the water shaft, referring to a water shaft leading into the city, 2 Sam 5.8a, Jerusalem in those days was a small city lying in a single spur of the hills on which the large city eventually stood. That happens a lot. Cities grow. Three those days was a small city, though, lying on a single spur of the hills on which the large city eventually stood. Its position was one of great natural strength because it was surrounded by, on three sides by deep valleys. This was why the Jebusites boastfully declared that even blind and lame could hold the, their city against a powerful attacking army. But the water supply of the city was poor. The population was entirely dependent on the spring that lay outside of the city on the eastern slope of the hill, so that they could obtain water without having to go down to where the spring was located. The Jebusites had constructed <coughs> an elaborate system of tunnels through the rock. First, they had dug a horizontal tunny, tunnel, tunny, tunnel, uh, beginning at the spring and proceeding toward the city. After digging for 90 feet, they hit a natural cave. From the cave, they dug a vertical shaft 45 feet high, and from the end of the shaft, a sloping tunnel 135 feet long, and a staircase that ended at the surface of the city, 110 feet above the water levels of the spring. The spring was then con concealed from the outside so that no enemy could t detect it. To get water, the Jebusite women went down through the upper tunnel and let their water skins down the shaft to draw water from the cave to which it was brought by natural flow through the horizontal tunnel that connected this cave with the sink. However, one question remained unanswered. The excavations of R.A.S. Mel Callister and J.G. Duncan some 40 years ago had uncovered a wall and a tower that were thought to be of Jebusite and Davidic origin, respectively. This tract of wall ran along the rim of the hill of Oakville, west of the tunnel entrance. Thus, the entrance was left outside of the protective city wall, exposed to the attacks and interference of enemies. Why hadn't the tunnel been built and went out inside the city? This puzzle has now been solved by the recent excavations of Kathleen Kenyon on Oakville, she found that McAllister and Duncan had given the wall and tower they discovered wrong dates. These things actually originated in the Hellenistic period. She uncovered the real Jebusite wall a little farther down the slope of the hill, east of the tunnel entrance, which now puts the entrance safely in the old city area. David, a native of Bethlehem, four miles south of Jerusalem, made the promise that the first man who entered the city through the water shaft would become his commander-in-chief. Joab, who was already generally general of the army, did not want to lose the, that position and therefore led the attack himself. The Israelites apparently went through the tunnel, climbed up the shaft, and were in the city before any of the besieged citizens had any idea that so bold a plan had been conceived. Avarham Barum speaks of a new discovery in 1994, a remarkable inscription from the 9th century BCE that refers to both the house of David and to the king of Israel. This is the first time that the name of David had been found in any ancient inscription outside of the Bible. <coughs> that the inscription refers not simply to David, uh, David, but to the house of David, the dynasty of the great Israelite king, is even more remarkable. This may be the oldest extra-biblical reference to Israel in Semitic script. If this inscription proves anything, it shows that both Israel and Judah, contrary to the claims of some scholarly biblical minimizers, were important kingdoms at this time. 